will just be one moment while we get this set up, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, perfect? All right. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Jonathan LeBlanc, and I lead the developer evangelism program within North America at PayPal. A huge part of what I've done in the industry over the past six, seven years has been working with a lot of startups in the industry, and definitely within the payment space. And the best part about working within the startup industry and working with startups is that you get to see all the technology trends in the industry. You get to grow as a company, as an individual, and see everything that's going on. And, you know, I could easily be up here and just talking to you about all the most successful products uh, that's, that are out there. But what I thought would be really fun, to, what I thought would be really fun today would be to uh, really just show you some of the commerce use case studies, some of the most challenging problems that we've run into as a company that I've worked really hard internally at, at getting fixed up and getting us a, a streamlined approach to help startups, to help developers who are building the next generation of software, the next generation of websites, and the next generation of commerce. Now, the biggest problem that I, I've seen in the industry, when you're, you're dealing with, when you're dealing with startups, when you're dealing with anyone that's in, the, in this new incubator or accelerator space, is that typically what a startup's going to do is take investor money to, to bootstrap. So they'll take seed stage funding, give away a large portion of their company. They'll, after seed stage, they're building up user growth, and by the time they've hit, they hit their, their seed stage end, where they're living off of, uh, off of noodles for, for three months, what they do is take Series A funding. Series A funding tends to be larger, but they keep giving away a piece of their company. And they're iterating on features over and over and over again, but they're not really thinking about the monetization potential. But as they're giving away gigantic portions of their company, you know, they're losing a part of themselves. They're losing a part of, of what, what makes their, their company special, what brings the passion behind their company. And, and that's the biggest problem that I'm seeing in the industry right now is that investors are really driving the startups that are coming out of these incubators, these accelerators. And it's because of this massive, relentless focus on user growth. User growth is an amazing, uh, amazing aspect of any startup and absolutely required for, for success. But the biggest problems come, uh, come into play when you're at the point where you want your company to stand on its own two feet, where you essentially want a full-blown product for yourself. You want to drive the innovation of your company, but you want to bring in your own money. But if you have investors and you have, have a lot of other people that have a part of your business that are all driving your own innovation, then what are you going to be left with? You have to build out features constantly, but at the same time, you, uh, you're left with simple choices. So you make the simplest choices for monetization, and those tend to be ads. Unfortunately, within, when you start advertising, your site starts to look like this. The architecture, what makes your site, your service beautiful, dies because it's hidden behind advertising. This is the last thing that you want in something that you feel so passionately about. I've had so many founders that I've, I've spoken to where they've said they've lost control of their company. They've lost control over, or, uh, over everything that they wanted to do and their company is something completely different that they don't even care about anymore. So when, you're co when it comes down to commerce and building out a proper commerce life, uh, life cycle and really building in a proper monetization method within your apps, this is everything that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis at PayPal building out different monetization strategies. And that's really a lot of, um, of, of what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis when work, working with startups. You know, and these startups can be in any realm. We see the traditional startups that are building on physical goods sales. They have products that they want to sell. You see this within auction sites. Uh, eBay was a prime example back, uh, back in the day and still is. But there's plenty of other startups that are being built on that exact same principle, selling physical goods. But really cool thing that we're seeing in the industry now is a complete blurring of the, li of the lines between physical and digital goods. So the digital space in the last couple of years that I've been speaking with startups has, has transformed itself where digital becomes the, the, you know, the new commerce life cycle because 
you can do a lot more with it. You're not dealing with physical goods or shipping. You're dealing with, with amazing digital products that, that can be virtually anything. They just take up a little space and that's it. Now when things get really interesting, you move away from commerce completely in the traditional sense. You're not selling anything in, in, this, in the sense of goods, digital or physical. Instead, what you're doing is selling data. The entire data architecture and data revolution that we're seeing within the industry is, uh, is an amazing thing to see because what they're doing is offering a free service, offering a product, and anyone can use it, anyone can, uh, can get on board with it, but what they're doing is anonymizing the data behind the scenes and offering a mechanism for buying that, that, that data. So sites, let's say, that want to know, um, you know, people that go to this site also go to that site. You know, companies that want to know this core information, that's what you can use for data sales. And it's, it's kind of amazing that this industry is taking off so much. And startups over the last, uh, last couple of years have really driven this industry. And then a lot of what I've built my entire career around is the aspects of personalization and identity. Taking these concepts, you have so many users that are coming on your sites, your services, and they're buying products, they're using your products, and you're obtaining a vast amount of information about their experiences, about the, what they're interested in. So why the heck wouldn't you start personalizing to them? Why wouldn't you use that information to make their experiences better? Users are no longer interested in having flat experiences that are the same to every single person that's using their products. They want something that's geared towards them. And as people are using new products, when you make them comfortable using your products and where you drive commerce based on that, you have a huge win and an uptake in sales, an uptake in commerce, and really building upon an amazing infrastructure. So that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. And I'll give you some case studies of companies that I've worked with that have had some major issues within this industry and what we've learned from it. Because when you're building a, a site, a service off of these principles, you really need to have the idea of every, every roadblock that you're going to run into. So let's start with one of my favorites, the digital revolution that we're seeing in the industry. So I worked with uh, a startup called Instamojo the, about six months ago. I started my, my work with them. They were part of 500 Startups, which is an accelerator program uh, you know, through most of North America, most of the world. They're expanding outwards. But what they were doing is building a digital marketplace so that you can have any particular digital good that you want, digital photography, digital artwork, um, music that's owned by you, and you can upload this and sell that in the marketplace. So it was an amazing revolution that we've seen on top of traditional marketplaces and something that was newer in the industry, something that, that wasn't traditional. Now, I helped them through their architecture, and when we w got into the PayPal integrations, we started working on products like Express Checkout and building out a light box window so that they didn't have to break their user experience by redirecting a user. And when you have those core considerations where you have a digital product, well, let's say you're selling music, you show first 10 seconds of, or you listen to the first 10 seconds of a song, you have the person go to pay for that song, the last thing you want to do is break the song and have it start right over. You just want it to continue after the payment. Same thing with digital gaming revolution. We've seen the exact same things. And when you really look at this type of an industry, when you really look at commerce in the digital sense, there's this really simple reason why people would want to move to this methodology. Look at physical goods. Every product that you sell has a massive amount of overhead. You have shipping costs, you have storage costs, you have manufacturing costs, you have staff costs to pack up everything. So with physical goods, your good product gets stripped down at each level by every cost that's incurred. And, but that's the traditional way that, that commerce has always been. In, in, if you look back decades, it's always been like that. But then we go to digital goods a few bytes. You're paying for storage. Someone is playing a game online and they're buying a product 
if they're buying an enhancement to that game, you are selling them literally just bytes of data. And that's what's really cool here, because you can be selling products for, uh, for you know, 100 pesos or, or something around those lines and giving them something that costs you nothing, except for an artist to render the product. You know, if you're selling, selling things that aren't, that aren't royalty free, that aren't products that yourself, like music, for instance, you pay royalties, but that's a minuscule amount of charges as opposed to everything that you're incurred from the physical goods space. So this is what we've experienced. Now, when we were working with this Instamojo model, we ran into a number of problems as we were building out their architecture because they were building something new in the industry. Biggest problem with digital products is that physical goods have an address that you ship to them. They have an actual location where you can track back the user to. Now, someone buys something on the internet, how do you track that? At this dispute, and that says, yes, it was actually them, what are you going to do? You, basically, it's one word against the other. And that's the last situation you want to be in as you're building a startup and building an infrastructure off of this type of a platform. So let's look at some of the issues that we learned in dealing with com companies like Instamojo and other startups in the industry that are building on those platforms. So chargebacks. People actually going through the credit card companies or going through disputes and saying, this product wasn't as described or that wasn't me. So we have to have ways of tracking those users, of, of actually saying, hey, yes, it was you and we can prove it. And there's cool ways that we can do that. I'll show you exactly how you can do that and, and really bi build a business infrastructure off of that. It's really not that complicated. Then the issues of fraud. Now, if you're dealing with people's credit card information, you have to worry about things like PCI compliance. You have to worry about things like secure, uh, securing that, that credit card information. And this is actually one of the reasons why I like working with PayPal so much is that the risk management within the entire, within the entire company is massive. We have an industry low fraud rate of 0.26%. And when you're dealing with, with a risk like this, it's the last thing that you want to, uh, want to deal with as an individual company because it's going to cost you a lot of money and you're going to run into a lot of problems over the time that you are selling these goods. It's, um, it's just definitely a no-brainer to go with uh, something that, an infrastructure that has this already in place. Then copyright owner concerns. Instamojo, as, mo as well as a lot of other startups in the industry, were running into the problems where people were uploading um, popular music or programs that weren't theirs, they were sharing this content. And so copyright concerns tend to, tend to come into place here. And this can actually affect your payment processing because you're, you, if you keep selling off someone else's music, eventually that's going to uh, catch up with you. And what it all comes down to is tracking your buyers. Now the old days back in the 90s or before when you can be anonymous online, those are gone. There are so many ways for you to track an individual online when they're purchasing a product. When they are building a, a, a commerce-based lifecycle off of digital products, you can track all their information to determine bits of identifiable information about them. To determine one in five billion or more computers that have likelihood of their computer. So as we're looking at fraud protection, as we're looking at these models, there are a couple of things that you can do. So as you're selling the product, you can do things like a, a IP to address billing uh, a correlation. So if you're so in the instances that we're working with, they were going through PayPal, they were paying, they had their account on file. We were able to determine the uh, the address information based off of that and ma match it to the IP address of the person that was purchasing the product. Now, obviously, this isn't completely 100% solid because you're dealing with, you can deal with Wi-Fi locations that might not be in the exact location, might be in a completely different, different country, depending on the IP address ranges. But it's an indicator of fraud. It's one small piece. 
And when it comes down to it, there's no silver bullet here. There's no one piece of information that's going to do everything for you. It's the correlation of everything that, that gives you the automatic distribution of saying, this is the computer that bought the product. That's what you want. Then, email domain type checking. This one's actually pretty easy. So it's easy, but in of itself, it doesn't give you a lot of identifiable data. So some people will log out with their personal email addresses or domains. You match these to the existing ones on file with their, their address information, their domains, and that matching information is going to give you a potential fraud. Now obviously, you strip out all those personal ones, you strip out all those small email domains, and you're de you end up with 60% of people with Gmail accounts. So obviously not the, not the key silver bullet. Then, user browsing habits. Now, I've advised for a lot of startups on this exact same realm, where they are essentially building out, uh, building out e-commerce infrastructures and they want to personalize everything based off identity products or something around those lines. Now, as you're, you're mining all this information about the user because they're purchasing products, they're viewing pages, they they're have this time on site and this interaction with your site and your content, you can use that to build out personality and buying profiles for the user. Using their browsing habits, using their buying habits, you can determine the characteristics of what they traditionally buy. Now, you have to be careful here. The problem that I ran into when I was building the, an exact system like this, a mining system uh, for, the, for this, you have to be aware of calendar years. So people's personality on buying profiles tend to change around Valentine's Day or Christmas. Those are key indicators. So it has to be over time that you, that you monitor this information to see if there's spikes in traffic. In the same way as if you take a credit card, uh, you have your credit card in your country and you have normal activity, then all of a sudden you start bouncing around the world, it gets, uh, gets uh, tagged as risky and gets, uh, gets locked down. Same thing here. You can do the exact same mechanism with personalization. Now, a lot of startups have opted for manual review. Because when you have a lot of money that's pa passing through, you have a potential for consumer, uh, consumer fraud if you're not using a system that doesn't have risk, li uh, risk management, like PayPal. If you have a homegrown solution, you have to go through these manual review steps, which is the case of a lot of the startups that we we're dealing with at first when we were advising them. So as you're, you're going through these manual review steps, as a startup, you want to make sure that, that all, the, all the potential fraud is taken into account. And obviously, when you're bootstrapped and you have no money, this is actually, a no, is actually an easy thing to do because you don't have a lot of traffic coming through. As you grow, this is impossible to scale. You cannot possibly do manual reviews. PayPal has so many transactions coming through and so much money coming through on a regular basis. Um, if you look at, uh, at the amount of uh, transactions in, uh, on just mobile alone in, um, uh, in the world for, for mobile development on PayPal systems, we've processed $140 billion just on mobile. Uh, so take a look at that as, you're, as your business starts going global. And, and as you're dealing with mechanisms like that, you cannot possibly manually review everything. And then, this is where things get fun. This is where we have a, a lot of fun tracking users. It's on device fingerprinting. How do I determine that a person, let's say that I am buying a product off of that laptop, how does the merchant determine that that is the laptop that purchased it? Well, there's a cool way you can do this. And it's actually pretty simple. So this is a site that has a really good overview of this. Uh, so it is uh, uh, up there, and all this information that you see here is char our characteristics about my laptop right here. And it can give you characteristics about your own if you go to it. Well, what it really is, is bits of identifiable information about the device fingerprint on your laptop. Trackable information back to how likely it is that that laptop uh, and, and other laptops exist in the same space with the same configuration. So if you look at it, user agent, browser, 12.01 uh, bits of identifiable information there just based on, on Chrome and, and the user agent and everything that, that I'm working with. Now only one in 4,117.11 computers share that same characteristics. Now obviously, not good enough. 
Go down to screen size, color depth. You can get information based on that. System fonts, the fonts installed on my system that I, that I can mine and, and find information about. The more configuration you put into your laptop, your computer, your mobile device, the more bits of identifiable information. So there's, in my laptop, there's over 21.6 bits of identifiable information, which means only one in 3,178,409 computers share the same characteristics. Combine these all together, you're more likely to get one, in, one computer in the world that shares those characteristics. This is how you track the information of a single computer back to a single user. And when disputes come by saying, hey, this was not the computer that purchased the product, you can prove otherwise. So as you're dealing with digital goods, this is the information that you should be storing. And it's very easy based in JavaScript, just pulling off the navigator object. Navigator object will have a lot of this information. And you see tons of JavaScript plugins that do the same thing. Server-side plugins do the same thing. You can pull all this information quite easily. Now, that's the digital revolution. Now, one thing that we have worked with quite heavily in, in Mexico has been a lot of mobile integrations, a lot of uh, a mobile revolution, if you would, where there's just a massive increase in mobile traffic. And this isn't just country-specific. We're seeing this everywhere in the world. Mobile devices are becoming the, the way that people get online. Uh, for instance, in, in Mexico, in, since 2010 to 2012, what we saw is a growth of 20, for going from 21.6% people, uh, 21 of people having a smartphone to around 42% in two years. We're seeing a 10% growth on that every year. Well, if you take a look at laptops or, or PCs, the growth is more like 6% or 5% and decreasing. So this is why mobile needs to become a primary citizen. But we deal with a lot of partners on a regular basis in the mobile sphere that, that deal with mobile, mobile intricacies. And there are a lot of questions that I get typically when I'm working with mobile devices or, or advocating for mobile startups. And that's working with the app stores. Every single time I go to a conference, the first question that comes by is, hey, do you a, have a magic solution for bypassing the app store? Because I don't want to pay 30% to Apple. I don't want to pay, uh, pay a percentage to any marketplace out there. Well, the truth is, again, no silver bullet here. There's no way to bypass the system because their regulations, what they've put in place for their terms, strictly states that you, any product that can be purchased within their stores has to be purchased, and you have to give them their percent. But that doesn't mean that you're, that you're dead in the water. It doesn't mean that you can't make your life easier. It doesn't mean that you can't work around this. Now, this is strictly, mostly for physical goods or services, things like that. But physical goods are, okay, are perfectly fine. You pop up a web view within your native application, and you're all set. You just load up a PayPal as a portal, go through the payments, and you're done. So physical goods don't really have this same problem. It's only within the digital sphere, where you're selling digital products. And we've seen just a massive change in that industry towards digital products from Probably around 2005, you had, you had a massive social networks coming up like Orchid and, uh, and uh, MySpace, Facebook. Uh, they've all taken their piece and they've all uh, built an infrastructure where applications can be built on top of their platforms, starting a situation where app developers were building digital enhancements to their products. So that's where we saw this revolution start taking place. But one of the things that we're doing at, uh, at PayPal, one of the things that I've been working on quite heavily with some of our departments, is a way to, a way to make it easier for people to pay. Now, you're going to have to go through the App Store for, for, physical go or for digital goods, but why have a painful experience in doing so? So one of the products that we were working with to try to, to fix this was called Payments Hub. What Payments Hub was doing was offering a way where no matter what store you were in, whatever, no matter what interface you were in, you could very easily just pop up the appropriate view, the appropriate payments for what you're doing. So if you're in, if you're in the iOS app store, if you have a native application, it would pop up the app store to do the payment. If you're in a web view, it would pay, pop up PayPal. Uh, if you're out on a Google Marketplace, it'll do the same thing. 
you know, all of these mechanisms make it easier. And we noticed that building a wrapper on top of this actually make the lives of people easier because they have to deal with these pains day in and day out. Now, why, have to uh, why should you have to deal with that? But there's other ways that a lot of these companies, a lot of these startups have gotten around it. So for instance, by all these little buzzwords here, essentially what I'm talking about with responsive design, with cross-platform applications, is building out a mobile website so people can use their mobile browser and go to your site and get a customized experience. There's nothing worse than having a web-based experience on your mobile device that looks chunky, doesn't work. So using responsive design where you, where you monitor essentially the screen, uh, the screen dimensions, you can shrink or grow the content so that you have a, a customized view. So the smaller your screen gets, the more information you're, you're going through. And this is best for your applications because this forces you as a company, forces you as an individual to, to figure out what's important about your product, to figure out exactly what should be shown on each instance. So a lot of companies have started doing this and migrating towards this. And in those instances, they can utilize a mobile payments library like PayPal to go through and do the payments very easily instead of having to go through the app store. Now, one of the other things that massive problems that we had seen with a lot of, um, a lot of mobile startups, startups out there is that they were requesting a lot of information right off the bat from uh, from people, from uh, essentially when you're trying to check out, they want a whole host of information to, uh, for your registration, for, for everything that you're trying to do and everything that you're trying to buy. Every screen that you put in front of a user where you have a lot of information like this, you see about a 30% drop off rate. This is why we've tried so, uh, so hard to show just the fewest amount of screens in front of a person. And that ties into a lot of the identity systems. So identity systems, one of the things that I, I've worked with in my career for a long time uh, have been open identity products. Uh, how many of you here have worked with open standards like OAuth 2, OAuth 1, OpenID Connect, OpenID? Okay. Well, basically, they're just open standards for logging people in, for authorizing applications, uh, for granting permissions. And these are the open technologies that are the basis for a mechanism that we have called login with PayPal. But really, it's the technology behind it, the idea behind it that, that's so important here. Because you can log in with concrete identity, that being your PayPal account in our, our instance. That, then you become known to the user. Since all the information that is being gathered from that PayPal account is all concrete verified user information like address, like locale, preferred language, uh, even gender, uh, you know, all these elements that you can get from a user allows you to bypass registration, allows you to bypass uh, the act of log uh, uh, logging in with a user a username and password. And really, that's what you want. So these identity, this identity overhaul has, has allowed us to, redo, to cut a two-screen flow, so asking a person to log in a checkout, then accept the payment, to a one-screen flow. You, you log in as you normally would at the beginning of your session. You do whatever you're going to do online on that site. And when you check out, it's one click. Increase of 30% automatically. Now that's what you want, because in this mobile infrastructure, it's all about removing complexities. Everything that you're learning about your users, all the in information that you gather from what they're doing, from what they're buying, all goes towards personalization and removing screens like this. If I saw this, when I was checking out, I would leave instantly. I'd say, oh, I don't really want that product because I'd have to fill this out on a mobile device on a mobile keyboard, which takes a long time. So the identity overhaul gives us the uh, ability to rem remove complexities like this, remove complexities of an extra screen. And in a mobile device environment, so this is what's key and important. Now, let's go to one of the most challenging things I've ever had to do in my career and ever had to work with. The aspects of crowdfunding. So think of Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is a, a really popular model where you're funding uh, you know, an end person to do something. 
But realistically, the most people that I talk to within Kickstarter, how many of you here have funded a Kickstarter campaign? All right, there's a couple. Now, have any of you got anything from it, or did your money just go into a black hole? Black, black hole, yeah. So that's the typical thing with crowdfunding, which makes it so difficult because your money, your money might go somewhere valid, or it might just drop off. So it's a very risky model to go through. And realistically, there's only a couple models like Kickstarter that have made money on it. But it's a model that's taking off because people are taking this idea behind crowdfunding, a lot of people all funding it in a source, and they are they're building something amazing out of it. They're building new products based on the same concepts. So the model is valid and really just needs, you just need to know how you're working with these systems to protect yourself, your consumers, the, the people that are being funded, and really uh, the payments that you're going through. So those are the problems that we've gone into. But usually when you talk about crowdfunding, there's a couple of models that tend to get mixed together, crowdfunding and group funding. But they're very different. So within crowdfunding, what you're dealing with is a whole bunch of people who are funding an individual to do something. So your funnel looks like this. A whole bunch of people funding an individual, and that individual might be doing something like uh, putting on an event, and they're paying out a whole bunch of people. So that, that in turn funnels outward. So you have this reverse funnel going on. The biggest problem here is that in order for proper fraud protection and prefer, for proper risk, you need to be able to track the money all the way down the stream to the end goal. Because how do you know that the person you're funding isn't just going to run off to some tropical island somewhere and just have a nice day in the sun? So these are the problems that you're running into with this type of model, is that they're very risky. But just like with digital goods, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do to protect everyone involved. So when I was working with, um, with crowdfunding, the, you know, this was probably about a year ago, back when crowdfunding started becoming popular when, with using payment providers like PayPal. So I had two companies coming in at the exact same time. One was a medium-sized business that had a little bit of funding behind it by, based on their other company. The other one was a bootstrap startup, no money. They had the exact same business model. They wanted to build a crowdfunding e application system that would uh, ha enable people to fund an event. The event might be a concert. The event might be a play. It might be something. And at the end of the day, um, what happened is they had very different ways of doing things. And the startup didn't get their application approved. At the same time, the medium-sized business did. And there's specific reasons behind that because of risk, because of, of their entire model. And this goes back to crowdfunding. You can't just go into it blind. You have to have an idea of how to protect everyone involved because it's probably the riskiest model that you're ever going to see. So we'll get into more about why that's, that's intricate and, and crazy. But first, group funding, that as opposed to crowdfunding, is a whole bunch of individuals funding an end goal. So most of the models that I see coming out of startups nowadays that are building off of a group funding model, what they're doing are things like tab splitting. You have a bunch of, a bunch of people, a bunch of friends that are going to, uh, to a, a bar or a restaurant. And at the end, of the, time, and the end of the day, you have one check and you want to split that. So you can pull out a bunch of credit cards and a bunch of cash and throw it all together and, and then you can fund that way. Or you can build a tab splitting application that allows people to fund from, from their phones. That's a, a real good in, uh, instance of a, a startup that I've seen built out. It's actually been built out several times by several different startups. And every hackathon I go to, I see at least one of these. So ta uh, group funding is another mechanism for, uh, for funding from a group of people. You might be funding something like tab splitting or funding people to, to buy a gift. But going back to our crowdfunding mechanism, why is it so hard? Why did that startup fail where that medium business did not? So starting out, I've mentioned this already, Kickstarter, maybe one other in the industry, one or two others, have been the only ones that have been really successful with the crowdfunding type of sphere. 
it tends to be very risky and you, people tend to run into problems because they think it's just like every other funding mechanism, every other startup that you can build, but it's not. It's very complicated at the end of the day, but there's just some, some normal rules that you can go through to make it so much easier for you. So at the end of the day, at the base level, before any application comes through, it's a risky model for the startup, for the end consumer, or anyone involved. Because of this reverse funnel mechanism that we're seeing with the funding where you can't track the money from point A to point B, you run into the problem of, of being able to track where the funding is going. And that's in conjunction with things like vetting your user base. So what happened with the startup is that they didn't want to vet out the, the people that were putting on these events, the, essentially that were starting these campaigns and accepting the funds. They could be anyone that just went online and said, I want to say accept money. Well, that's a very, a very risky because there's no identifiable information that's targeted back to them with the exception of the fact that they created an account under whatever information they want. But if you can vet out your owners, which is what the medium-sized business did, where they verify them with a PayPal account, it becomes a less risky model because you can track the funding. That, that vetted out user becomes responsible for all chargebacks, for all, all money that has to come back from that account. And that's what you want because that pulls the onus off of you as the startup. What would have happened is if that startup would have had its model where they didn't vet out the end users, and let's say a campaign pulled in a couple hundred thousand US because it was a US based business. And what, uh, what would have happened is at the end of the campaign, the person took off, took the money. Everyone would have wanted their money back because they didn't, they didn't see the event. And it hit that tipping point where all the money was pulled out of the accounts. But they would go back and, ch and try to get that money from their credit card companies, which in turn would get, try to get it from their pay, the individual's PayPal account or these, um, these medium, uh, the small business, the startup. So in one event, the startup can go completely bankrupt. And that's what you don't want. That's what you have to protect against. You're protecting the end consumer and you're protecting the business. That's what you're trying to do here, is you're protecting every single party involved. It's not just protecting the, the payment provider themselves, because PayPal has risky ventures go, going on with every startup that's coming through, because they're startups. In, in their nature, they are risky. So just mitigating the risk for the end consumer is what you have to worry about and for your business. Then, one of the other problems that they ran into, the, the, the uh, startup, was that they wanted three month or more campaigns. So they would authorize the funds, hold the funds, and then let's say three months later, four months later, up to six months, then they would start pulling out the funds. Well, unfortunately, what really happens with credit card companies is after a, cu after a couple of days, you, uh, the holds might not be exactly there. The money might not be exactly there. But for the most part, anything under a 30-day period is likely to get all the funding. So you're likely to get all that money put into your account. Anything beyond there, credit cards might change, the holds are gone, and you're lucky to get the money. So the model becomes incredibly riskier because then you're fun what are you funding at the end of the day when your funding hits a, ten a tipping point where you raise your, your money that you need for the event and all of a sudden you have a third of the money that you thought you had. So the medium-sized business was, was doing exactly this, had a short term of 15 days to, to 30 days, or under 30 days, which meant that all the funds would, most of the funds would be able to come through. It was a very valid approach. And then obviously handling the chargebacks, which we've already talked about. In the case of, uh, of not vetting out your, your end users, of vetting out the people that are, that are uh, handling your money or getting all this money coming in, you, are, you become responsible for it as a startup. You, become, you are, your merchant, are the merchant of record right here. So ideally what you want is to vet out these end users to make sure that you can track this money to its final source. 
So that's the case of one failure and one success. But I worked about three months with that startup to try to push them through, change their architecture. And at the end of the day, they didn't want to change this model so completely to fit these, these non-risky rules. They were taking too many chances on a model that is probably the riskiest to begin with. Then, as we, if we go to other models like group funding, you can see some similarities, but there are definite differences. You know, are you doing short-term versus long-term money holding? In the case of tab splitting or, or everyone putting in a lot of money towards a group gift or something like that, the benefit here is that you have short-term. You're likely only going to hold money for a couple of days, which means you're guaranteed to have the money there. Became, it becomes a, a very non-risky model. So unlike that crowdfunding. Then you have, are you sending all the money to a single person to buy the gift? Or are you just funding a merchant? Obviously, the, the best choice is to have a whole bunch of people all funding that single merchant at the same time. Um, with the, our mechanism for doing that is something called adaptive payments with chained payments. It's a whole bunch of people all, or sorry, parallel payments, where they all pay in parallel. But this type of methodology is, is actually easy to comprehend. It's a whole bunch of people all paying at the same time to the end goal. So this is the type of model that you want when you're building out a payment infrastructure on top of group funding. Again, not risky. But then there's always the question of who's responsible for chargebacks and refunds. In this model, 95% of the time, what you're going to see is a whole bunch of people that know each other that are all funding the same thing. They're uh, putting in for group funding this way. So this model isn't really about pushing out refunds or chargebacks because this rarely ever happens because you know each other. You're not a whole bunch of anonymous strangers funding some end goal. So this becomes a completely non-risky model as opposed to crowdfunding. So let's go from there and lo look at this massively risky model to something that's, that's really cool in the industry and seeing a massive, massive revolution. So that's the idea of building off of data. I've worked with a lot of startups that have uh, built out dashboard-based systems, built out, uh, built out their systems so that they can sell data. Now, there's an old adage in the industry uh, that I've heard over the years, where if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. So if you have a free service that you're using, what's most likely going on behind the scenes is those startups, those companies, are mining identifiable information about you, anonymizing that data so that it's not directly attributable back to you out in the outside world, and then using that data for sales. There's plenty of startups that are doing it, and large companies that you probably use on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we go to those types of models, look at traditional brick and mortars, um, your storefronts. And I can tell you a case of this. Um, so there's um, a department store much like Walmart in, in uh, the US and Canada called Target, pretty much exactly like Walmart. And what they, uh, what, an interesting thing happened a couple of years ago. So this teenage girl, I think she was around 16 years old, she started getting a whole bunch of coupon booklets from Target giving her discounts on baby goods, uh, diapers and, and baby formula, um, uh, you know, um, diaper bags, things like that. And she was 16 at the time. And her father kept seeing these things coming in and eventually just got furious with, uh, with Target and proceeded to walk his, uh, himself down to Target and yell at every single person on that staff saying, why are you exposing my daughter to this? She's 16, she's not pregnant. Why are you sending this information? It's not okay. So after his fit, he went home, he talked to his daughter. Turns out his daughter was pregnant. Now this is where things get both cool and creepy all at the same time. Here's what Target was doing. So, the, uh, so Target was monitoring all the information that she was buying. So she was buying things like uh, handbags that could double as diaper bags that were big enough for that. Unscented lotions. She was buying uh, vitamin supplements. And normally in a brick and mortar store, you wouldn't think anything of this because it's just products that you're buying. 
But based on the analytics of the data that was coming in from what she was uh, from what she was buying, their analysts were able to determine a likelihood that she was pregnant. And getting even creepier than that, they were able to determine her approximate trimester and a very close due date. So, this type of model is what a lot of a lot of these brick and mortar stores like Target, like Walmart are doing. Walmart's doing the exact same thing. They have an entire research lab, uh, Walmart uh, Walmart Labs, that's built off of these exact same things. If you're using your credit cards, the data is being mined, the data is being obtained and, you, and personalized for your experiences, because they're selling the data now. What they're what they're doing based on those coupon booklets is, let's say you're this 16-year-old girl. And if you're going into a baby department store, the first time I went into one of these, when, before my daughter was born, I walked into that and complete blank face. I had no idea what everything was. I was so confused. My wife was so confused. And we, we spent three hours looking at bottles. Now, obviously, when you're, when you're conf uh, confused, just like that 16-year-old girl was, just like I was as a new parent, you're going to go with the company that has just sent you all these discounts for, for products that you're going to need because that coupon book includes everything that you're going to need. That's how they make money off data. Now, if you go on the digital sense, I'm an advisor for a startup, um, a brand new startup that's just launched called Stop That. Now, one of, one of the things that they do with their data sense is they, uh, they allow you to check into websites and, and, and really just curate those websites so that you can maintain the information, much like in a bookmarklet type of se sense. But in, this, the startup in and of itself, that part isn't innovative. What's innovative is that every single time you check into a website, they have a data mining engine behind that to determine the personality characteristics of what you've, uh, what you've looked at, what you're engaging with. From that, they're able to determine the characteristics of a page, and then as you check into two, three, four different sites, those pages start, the characteristics of those pages overlap. That becomes your personality profile. So after three or four check-ins, they have a unique personality profile that's built off of you. So in that sense, they take that data and recommend new products to you, recommend new sites, recommend groups and people all the information to allow you to find new things, to discover new things on the web. But behind the, behind the scenes, look at what the data can give you. If you build out a dashboard system where you have, uh, have uh, companies that are interested in seeing, hey, I, I, who, the people who come to my site, what else are they doing? What else are they interested in? And building out a dashboard based off of that mechanism is a way of, uh, of utilizing digital data in order to sell a product. And in the instances where we've worked through PayPal mechanisms through this, it's actually a simple mechanism for payments. When you are selling that data, you're selling subscriptions. You're selling a monthly subscriptions to a dashboard data. You're, you're selling anonymous data for these individual sites. It's a very simple payment method behind a very complex and unique instance in the commerce space. But I've been working in this data mining industry for a long, long time. And the biggest problem that I see and have seen with a lot of these companies is that people who are building out these engines uh, tend to be engineers like myself. When I was building out my first data mining engine to build out a personality mechanism like that, what I ran into was that I asked myself the question, Hey, based on this data, can I actually determine, from X, can I determine Y? And almost always the answer was yes. But just because I can do something doesn't mean I should. And that's the, really the rule that all companies, all startups should live by when they're dealing with personal data. Because you're not dealing with just data here, you're dealing with personality profiles, you're dealing with human beings, and they should be treated that way. So all data, when you have an identity infrastructure like this, where you're building a data platform off of, off of these instances, everything should be anonymized. You should never have identifiable information that can be trackable back to, an, uh, to a single person. Because that'll get you in a whole slew of trouble. 
there's been a lot of large companies that have gone through this and, and have just got slammed. If you're a startup and you do this and you have personalized information where, and where people don't trust you anymore, your startup's gone. You're dead. Then, personalize, use that data to personalize in the same way that that company stopped at is, is using it to, to personalize the experience and recommend new products. That data infrastructure is built off of improving that experience, building off the identity infrastructure, much like you can that we at PayPal have built through login with PayPal or through our subscription-based models. Building off all those same mechanisms, you can build out a, a nice personalization engine that doesn't abuse your users. Now, if we go a little further, some of the problems with this type of model is that there is really a long time before the data becomes valuable. You have, to try, you have to have a lot of users coming in before there's really some great data coming in. Uh, really data that you can utilize for, for selling, for building out a dashboard system, because you need to combine all that together. And having, uh, having a data mining engine like this, or having any sort of data engine that you're using to sell, always has a narrow focus. You have a focus on something that's specific to your company or your goals, and that's what you're selling. So the data is very narrow. You have to have a specific purpose and the idea in mind. OK. So these are our case studies. These are everything that we've uh, gone through. But all of this information, all of these commerce backbones, everything that we've explored in PayPal through all of our products, all of our innovation, uh, everything that we fought for for these companies can actually be used to do some amazing things in the industry. So what I'm seeing coming through with identity products, with personalization, are some very interesting things. In the old way of recommendation systems, you just have to know your product. Person A bought this, uh, and they also bought this and this. And you can recommend that to other people. But that's flat. The, and you know, optimists in and of themselves have said that this type of model can actually increase your user growth, or your, your buying growth, by about 30%. Realistically, this is more like 15 to 20 percent on a normal case. But let's take that identity model and tie in our identity information that we have that we have gained about the user, tie in all that personalization information that we've got from their buying habits, and tie that into a recommendation system, and you have something that's geared towards one particular user. And using this type of mechanism, you have something that can hit that 30% growth because it's specifically geared towards those people. I mean, look at what Facebook was doing with their targeted advertising. They saw a massive uptake in, in growth on advertising revenue based off of that. Exact same thing here. Then, one of the really cool things that you can do with, um, with monitoring user action and user personality profile comes down to the action, uh, uh, tracking the actions of a user to determine their intent, what they intend to do, and building out things based off of that. So let's look at a use case here to show you what I mean. If a person is bored with a product as they're going through their, their cell phone, you, you'll watch them as they're using their cell phone. Let's say they're going out and they have a list of a whole bunch of products and they keep scrolling through. They've added a few things to the cart, but then you see this type of scrolling or they'll move like that. You have repetitive motions. And traits of people who are bored tend to be things like distraction. So what you can do is you're monitoring people who are interacting with your sites. You monitor uh, essentially what, uh, what they're doing and whether there's a drop off uh, in, in their usage. So all of a sudden, if they're not clicking on anything, scrolling, or doing anything for a prolonged time, key indicator of distraction. Repetition. There's re uh, repetitive motions like up and down, slowly moving or doing this. I've done that so many times and I've seen a lot of people doing this where they'll just roll their fingers like this, moving the screen around and all of that. But these are really key indicators of re repetition. Tiredness is obviously something that we can't track. But the reasons behind boredom, besides a lack of interest, might be something like the willingness to, show, to have an action performed. Wi they want to, uh, to be shown the next action. So if they've added a few things to their cart, if you see indicators like these coming up, what this means is that you can all of a sudden push them to a cart experience saying, would you like to check out? And you've automatically determined their emotional state. 
their state of boredom and push them to an end action that's beneficial for you instead of them just leaving and saying, oh, I'll check out next time and you losing that profit. So this is what personalization, this is what everything around the identity model and everything that we're, uh, the basis of the architecture that we're building with mechanisms like login with PayPal, like our identity infrastructure, everything that we're building out is exactly like this. So thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate you joining me. Uh, and we'll open for questions. Thanks. Pondo, pondo. Bien. Muchas gracias, Mr. Mr. Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, preguntas? Levanta la mano, por favor. Bien. Eh, si la quieren hacer en, en inglés no hay ningún problema, si lo quieren hacer en español nos van a estar apoyando en nuestra traducción. Eh, si tú lo que estás pidiendo es este, estudiar los hábitos de consumo en cuanto a clics, lo que están resolviendo es el problema de privacidad para no atacar directamente lo que serían hábitos y consumos del cliente. Eso es lo que están buscando a través de estudiar el comportamiento en cuanto a la navegación para hacer la privacidad a un lado y superar ese tema. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, yeah, so privacy concerns in that aspect come back to the idea behind identity mining and anonymizing the data. Using it for personalization is what, I've always, what I always advocate. You're using this to essentially improve the experience of the user. It's beneficial for you at the end goal, but it's also beneficial for the user because they're shown the next step. Everything that I talk to around this is around building out um, almost design engines where you can change the design of a site based off these characteristics. It only becomes a privacy concern when you have people that are mining that da data and using it to uh, abuse a situation where you're, um, where you're essentially using that data to manipulate the user. It's the last thing that you want to do. You just want to show them the next step. Uh, good morning. Here. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how do you win the trust of the customer? Like, because in the United States, PayPal is like very common, mm -hmm. like buying online. But here, uh, personally, I have seen my parents worried, telling me, will you receive that? Or why are you buying online? Like they don't trust this kind of technologies, let's call them. How do you win that trust? Uh, absolutely. So this is something that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as a developer evangelist. I'm going to think of me like a bridge between the internal engineering team and the external developer environment or external, uh, external consumers. Now, the biggest problem when, when I see that, and definitely with talking with a lot of people over here, the biggest problem is um, with that redirect. When you start redirecting people to the PayPal site, it's actually for security. It's so that they can log into PayPal, where they can uh, they have a secure instance, as opposed to inputting all that information on a site that you might not trust or that you might not be sure what they're doing behind the scenes. But the way that we win trust is by education. It's by uh, you know the slow change in the industry where we are just out there having these conversations with people and showing them that it's secure. Uh, the, the simple fact that we have this risk management system behind the scenes that has a really low fraud rate, that's what we use to uh, as a point of, uh, of selling it. Um, not so much selling it, but proving it. And when it comes down to it, myself, I have to prove everything that I do to developer audience. It's why all of us are developers ourselves. And they're always very critical of everything we're doing. So we have to prove by doing the right thing ourselves. If we do thing to uh, do something to abuse our customers our credibility is gone Here. okay um, so um, I think this is very efficient I mean I'm experienced that myself <laughs> and um, a particular question um, this this um, these companies have a lot of resources and a lot of ways to gather this information but um, with starters I mean they're probably uh, be uh, some key aspects that we could gather. Uh, what would those be uh, if I'm starting a website and I'm starting to sell things throughout the internet? Mm -hmm. What will be the, the, the key aspects to gather 
uh, from the user's data to, to start building my own um, data dashboard. So the one thing that I would suggest for any startup that's building out a commerce-based situation, a commerce-based profile, is you start be, uh, with knowing your own products. So you, as a company, know your products better than anyone. So you start with that. So as people are purchasing products, you tra are tracking their purchases. Those purchases could be all correlated together to be within a realm. So purchases, let's say, for fishing gear would be in a sports realm. Um, so as you break up your product architecture, your inventory system based off of that, that's how you start with a recommendation system. That's how you start with your personalization. Um, I, obviously, identity data mining and utilizing mechanisms like that is a whole other complicated realm. That's a whole other slew where I've, I've worked for 10 plus years working off systems like this, and, and I still have lots to learn uh, in that industry. I'm constantly failing at it. A startup that doesn't know those mechanisms always knows their product. That's the best way to start. Hello, my name is Dan. What happens if we give people a social reward, such as a badge or achievement unlock, when they check out? Is it bad? Can they so, uh, get addicted? You're, ta you're talking about gamifica uh, gamification or reward systems, essentially. Um, so these have actually been very beneficial in, uh, in most instances that I've seen. Uh, gamification, or the aspects of gamification or a reward system in this case on checking out um, can be beneficial, but it has to have some goal. So one of the best parts about a reward-based system is a, also as, adding in a competitive aspect. So in all the commerce-based studies that I've, been, that I've researched in the past, uh, where you have auction-based sites, it's all about competition. Auction-based sites work off of competition. It's, uh, so adding in the mechanism of rewards based off the comp uh, competitive aspects that are in built into ourselves as human beings and really builds out some really good rewards. But offering a reward system, uh, it's the same as offering a coupon or a benefit. Or uh, let's say you go to a restaurant and they give you 30% uh, off your next purchase. Same thing. So it is beneficial. Uh I want to know if, if you have any approximate number about how many money is being spent in Mexico via PayPal. You want, you want me to take that one? I, I, have, I have numbers for mobile. Yeah, no, all right. Mm, mira, el, el tamaño del e-commerce más o menos el año pasado se estimó en 6 billones de dólares aquí en México. Eh, el número, el monto de lo que se está procesando a través de PayPal... Gracias. No lo podríamos comentar. Lo que te puedo decir es que tenemos 2.5 millones de clientes de, de cuentas. Entonces eso te puede dar una idea de bueno cuánta gente no en el país tiene una cuenta PayPal y está comprando el dinero. Thank you very much, Gracias. Everyone. Un aplauso por favor. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, los invitamos a que nos acompañen en la siguiente plática.